right now uh, if you're not doing ai it seems like you're not really part of the cutting edge technology world you will never know when this is going to come handy welcome to cio news i am simran shivankar a journalist at cio news and your host for today this session is being recorded and it will be available on our website cionews.co.in on our youtube channel and our linkedin handle as well today we are back with yet another episode from our exclusive series called voice of cio and we are joined by dr prince joseph he is a group cio at sfo technologies an award winning business technology leader known for driving digital transformation across diverse industries with expertise spanning erp modernization ai adoption in manufacturing and a robust background in cyber security and enterprise it mr joseph has earned acclaim for his strategic leadership and innovation in leveraging emerging technologies to enhance operational efficiency and customer experience mr joseph thank you so much for being a part of the series and joining us today thank you samran it's a pleasure to join and uh, thank you for having me not a problem and uh, thank you once again as i said thank you uh, for thank you for bringing to do this with us that being said uh, uh, as i already said a remarkable journey your career spans from different industries like hospitality manufacturing and it with such a diverse experience can you share a bit about your journey and you know take us through your role what's involved in you know everything that's going to be quite a walk back on memory lane for me the um, uh, whole concept of of looking at things with the mindset or the perspective of a cio uh, that started in my that started to to get into my my consciousness i think when i was in emirates when i was working with, in the middle east with emirates airline there was a point of time when uh, uh, post a major process transformation uh, we had set up the whole it organization to be distinct where we had uh, made a move to make it more aligned to the business closer to the business uh, a true business it alignment was something that was sought after and i had a, a chance to play the role of a business it manager and the business it head was playing the liaison between a particular business unit and the it division so at that time you start thinking about all the uh, requirement that the business has in terms of how do you support the strategy how do you start looking at the programs that you've got for the year how do you start uh, really considering things which are uh, capex in nature opex in nature strategic in nature operational in nature tactical in nature these kind of things start coming into you and you start evaluating things but you start assessing things uh, in a different with a different lens this this experience um, from then on you start looking at every new initiative with uh, with a whole new um, whole new understanding and respect and also you also filter out many things and when you know that uh, some things need to be supported you are now in a position to support that initiative when some things are being discarded because it's not uh, justified the right way you are now in a position to go and justify that when you when you see something is being pushed through without it being fully thought through uh, risks are there and 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 it's just uh, uh, probably not going to be that benefits in the long run you have the role to actually play the gatekeeper and and challenge it and 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 uh, get that to be uh, slowed down or stopped or reviewed so uh, having worked in in uh, in in the emirates group the exposure was towards airlines first then while there you know you are exposed to cargo you are exposed to commercial you are exposed to hospitality so that you're exposed to airports management you're exposed to it and technology because the budgets were huge you had uh, a lot of things to play with internal it itself was was a business of by itself which was you know if you look at the uh, the cost implications of it was running into into hundreds of millions so you had so many ways uh, so many many industries clubbed into one within that group itself but post moving from the uh, uh, you know from that experience i had a chance to play a role in logistics and supply chain and for the past 5 years i've been manufacturing so uh, when you move from different industry verticals you are carrying with you a core amount of 
technology knowledge, a core amount of transferable skills, but you're also becoming a different sort of a leader because you're able to go and apply what you've learned in other industries into newer industries. Manufacturing was a particularly interesting challenge because I have never done anything like this in my whole life. Uh, everything else was was service oriented. Now you're actually seeing you got to create hardware and you got to sell this and you got to have an IT operation which supports that. And this is high tech electronics and there's a whole different level of complexity coming in. Um, you know, the, the key thing there is you need to have an interest to learn this. If you don't have an interest to learn this business and that's, that's really the, the, the step one. You know, do you want to fall in love with this business that you're going to go and support? Then things make make uh, make sense, and everything kind of goes on from there. So, you, your individual skills, your attitude towards what you want to do, your openness, your growth mindset, and the fact that you really want to go and make a difference and earn a seat at the seat at the at the table of the of the executives. That's what really has been, you know, in summary, the kind of journey I would I would say I've been through. Great, and thank you so much for taking us through this journey and giving us a more comprehensive view about you know your role as a CIO. You started it, how you are navigating. Um, on the same lines, you also emphasize on you know high performance teams. So um, I just want to understand from you: are there any particular uh, things or any qualities mm-hmm. you look for when assembling teams, or uh, how do you encourage or foster this you know team collaboration? This is also an interesting question because if you were to go and pick a team and if you were to look at how teams are picked, if you look at, uh, um, you know, one of the analogies I would I would draw is um, the best football team and if you put all the best football players together, do you go and win the World Cup? You don't. Uh, there's, a, there's a whole different uh, way to manage it and you get the team to perform because everybody has got to have a different, uh, has, has to, to have the right role to play which is suiting them, which is their skill, which is also something that they're able to to immerse into. Uh, many a times you're inheriting a team. Many a times you are, um, there are, there are very few times you actually form a brand new team yourself. There's always something there and you want to nurture that. You want to, you want to grow on that. So what I try to look for is, you know, there are, when, when you inherit something, there are always um, members who, who have the solutions in their head, you know, who are actually having the skills that you can really build on. The the, the biggest uh, success for a leader would be to figure out how can you figure out who are the right people to take along with you for the journey? What are the gaps that we have now? What's making them, what is stopping them from achieving bigger things? And to figure out the, the, the people who are putting the brakes on all of this. So, uh, that part is difficult, but th- there will be, and th- th- that's not going to be a large number. It could be just one or two persons <laughs> who actually are creating a whole lot of, of pain. The moment you figure out, you know, this is what you want to build, this is what you want to help sustain, this is the gaps you want to fill, and this is what you want to weed out, uh, you've got to really put in motion, how do you achieve that? Uh, there are things you can do very technically in terms of skill development. There is things you need to do as a leader where you're showing that you are also very involved in this initiative. You are very interested in the outcomes of this. You are part of this. And and I typically keep my door open. Right now it's closed because I don't want anyone walking in because of the interview, but otherwise I keep my door open and that's how it's been all along. And that is something which is, is something, you know, I'm not going to say everybody has to do the same way because everybody works in a different sort of energy. Uh, everybody works in, comes in with a different sort of personality. Um, I prefer to listen to people as they come in and tell me stuff. And then I'm able to work with them to see what needs to be done. Uh, there are times when, you know, there are leaders who will come in and, and tell you what needs to be done. And and depends on uh, an analysis you do of the people. Uh, Largely, when you find that you're working with a lot of introverted people, then you try to get the uh, thoughts to come out through writing. You know, you put across things where you say, well, fill this up and let's talk about it. When they fill it up, you're actually now able to see a lot more. Because if you say, sit here, now talk to me, tell me about this, you may not get much. So there are different ways to do, you can approach different people and you can get different outputs. So for me, the, the main thing is, if there's, the, the, the team that you're working with a sense of purpose because that's important for me as well I'm deeply interested in the outcome of, of this initiative and from there everything starts and then you got to see you know if, if I'm 
if this is going to be successful, I'm going to make sure that you're going to be successful in the next stage of your career as well. And demonstrate that because we are not doing small, you know, short term stuff. We're doing stuff which keeps on going every year. You've got to demonstrate that in the appraisals and the reviews and the uh, uh, and how you take care of the team. And, and when that becomes uh, uh, known, I think it gives out the aura that people want to stay with, work with you and they want to grow and develop and they see that it is possible, it happens. So those are the things that I look for and, and I try to follow. Uh, there's a lot more in people management that you can talk about. People follow, you know, the, the matter of the most essence is, can you really uh, get this person to join this mission with you? And what confidence do you have that that person is on the same mission? And if that's the gap that you need to fill. The moment they're on the mission, you know, the whole journey is going to be so much more easier for everybody. Absolutely. And thank you so much once again for answering that. Uh, again, uh, coming back to remarkable experience, I would uh, also like to understand from you, uh, what are some of the biggest challenges according to you when it comes to implementing new technologies like AI and cloud, uh, you know, anything that you have particularly found out on challenging? So, you know, right now, uh, if you're not doing AI, it seems like you're not really part of the cutting edge technology world. So you've got to be doing AI of some sort. It was the same thing when cloud came out as well. But cloud had a different appeal because you were trying to say that, you know, you're trying to move the funds in such a way that you don't have to invest. It's going to be OPEX and that's uh, that was a different sell. But there was also other challenges in there. Now, when it comes to adopting any new emerging technology, um, I think for me, I'm open to to anything coming out of the blocks in terms of you know what's coming out of Silicon Valley, what's coming out of our, our, our partner ecosystem, what's coming out of any uh, small innovative startup that's coming in, that's fine. We, we want to know what they're doing because there's something which, which is probably going to be of use. But adopting that and putting it into the organization or adopting it into the enterprise, that's a different that's a different kettle of fish. Now, just two days back, we know what happened with you know, a large company and a, a security partner. I don't want to take the names, but it, it shows that, you know, while you're running, you actually forget some some basics and you can't afford to do that. When you and, and that's the part where you need to keep everybody grounded on the fact that, you know, that the foundational processes always matter. You can't really short circuit anything. Um, and to introduce a whole new technology into into a into an organization, let's find out. Uh, this, this this is probably known to everyone. Pick a pilot area, pick something which is low risk, but shows an an outcome. And if you're able to see results, then let's slowly scale it out. In an enterprise, I don't think I would ever advocate that let's do this fast, uh, because you have told so much of legacy. You cannot do that unless you are born in the cloud and you are a brand new company and you can make all those decisions. But if you're an enterprise that's been running for 30, 40 years, there's lots of pockets on, of, of information and systems and data sets and silos and people and culture. Uh, if you try to do this, it will break. It will just come to a, a, a supreme standstill. So for organizations like the ones that I've been through and where I am right now, you pick an area which is open for innovation low on risk, but we are able to see uh, and show the, uh, demonstrate results. Then pick that up as an example, make a template out of it, create the process, let there be a team and a structure to support support the scaling out. Make sure that you have third parties, you have uh, enough protections put in place and then build on it. So at the moment, you know, cloud has become pretty much mainstay. Um, I would say when I joined the company, we were 80, 20, where 80 was on prem and less than 20 was on the cloud but now it's the reverse and and that's a that's a that's that's the journey that that's the evolution that will happen with ai now we have started introducing it there are some use cases where we're working on where we are seeing results but it also affects um, a larger data set uh, it also affects uh, things where you want to be assured that your data is not going to be going out it's not going to be misused it's not going to be feeding some LLM which may cause you an issue. You also are sitting on confidential data given to you by customers and there is no IP infringement happening. So you're worried about the AI scale out a little bit. But AI for productivity, you might think about it and, and open that. But even there, 
you know, you want to do it in a slow and a deliberate manner. Uh, along the same line, because you already already said, uh, you know, AI is now the top of the town, and it's either you embrace the technology or, or you're out of the game. It's as simple as that. But uh, for manufacturers, as because you're you know you've been into manufacturing as well, uh, for uh, manufacturers and of course other uh, businesses and organizations as well who are considering AI adoption, any uh, recommendations or advice that you would get, you know, or you would suggest. while getting started and you know uh maximizing to maximize the benefits of this technology so um when you look at manufacturing or when you look at any anything for that matter any process or any business there's always this maturity scale right so if you are at the highest level of maturity then you are really um working in the most conscious way you are you are making decisions which is always right you know you are always at the right place your customer you know you are responding to them um in 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 a, in a manner that always pleases them but that's the level of maturity but for us to get there there is there is stages to go through now when it comes to manufacturing um the focus is a little diff- and and manufacturing also has got different connotations there are different types of manufacturing you could be manufacturing a product you could be manufacturing components or you could be manufacturing pieces or assemblies which goes into other products so contract manufacturing is different product manufacturing is different everyone's got a, it's got its own nuances but at the end of the day you know you are providing a service which is now hardware and maybe software mixed to a customer so how for us the reason for our existence is we are able to create these components and pass it on at the time that we uh, promised that it will be delivered in the quantity that was also agreed at the price that that we negotiated but the management of of doing that or achieving that uh, at sale time you can promise a lot of things and manufacturing is not one of those small projects which you run for many years and you deliver something and then it is continuous you got to do this day in day out right you're talking about volumes you're talking about complexity where you got hundreds thousands of parts going into one 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 piece and this has got to be shipped out uh, so you got shipping you got materials coming in you got the process to be done and the process also you know if i were to just say you know look at this phone this phone is probably made up of 20 30 50000 100000 100, components now how do you manufacture this now uh, you got one assembly for the camera you got one assembly for the speaker you got one assembly for the screen and each one is a different project by itself and it's all coming integrated integrated into this into this package nobody appreciates this but the there is a lot of complexity that goes into manufacturing this now if we are a business that's doing a phone an mri machine um, a missile guidance chip um, energy meter thousand different products then you're dealing with a different sort of 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 challenge so in manufacturing what you want to try and do is the most important thing is i've got capacity uh, now I'll, i'll relate it to a hotel and and an airline hotels got rooms airlines got seats right and today the airline has taken off with five empty seats means that's five empty that's five seats that is not going to give you any revenue ever that's lost forever the same thing with the hotel room if the, if you have 100 rooms and you only tonight only 80 are occupied those 20 rooms you have lost revenue and that is never going to come back tomorrow it's a whole different day it's a whole different challenge now for me i've invested in machinery plant factories so sfo and nest we've got 28 factories worldwide now all these 28 factories have lines factory lines assembly lines machine machinery uh, all invested to do certain work what's important is how do we keep this ticking how do we keep this from having low downtime how do we keep the lines flowing how do we make sure that the output that we produce is going to be the maximum that's really the the purpose of the machinery and the plants and the people around it so that your business development will want to make sure that they bring business in so that you keep this running your operations guys will want to make sure that whatever business we've got we are delivering you know your supply chain will team will have to have the responsibility to make sure that all the material needed for the plant is brought in and all of them are relying on your systems on 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 data on on erps and on different disparate systems they all need to come together so this single uh, objective can be met that we keep the plant running and the plant keeps on <laughs> So if the plant keeps running the customer is happy we make money everybody is doing their part in this whole chain so where does uh, you know ai or, in, or or the data management analytics comes in it's huge the play the, the role that it plays we got pockets of data from customers our own silos our own different factories we got 
700, 800 or 1000 plus suppliers who are giving us data. We got to have our own processes to be analyzed. We got to look at the shipping schedules and logistics parts to be analyzed. And how do you optimally do all this? For that, you need not just an ERP system, you need an analytics layer, you need an intelligence layer on top of it, you need a decision making layer on top of it. And then it becomes a different, that's how you differentiate yourself. That's how you become, you know, go to the next level of maturity. So uh, in manufacturing, that's one dimension and where I would say, you know, how I can express this is going to be leveraged. Great. And Hope you. that made sense. <laughs> Absolutely. In fact, uh, thank you so much for giving me a comprehensive view. I'm sure uh, we have a call. Leaders from the manufacturing uh, business, they can certainly agree on this and they have a lot to take out or uh, take away from what you've just said. Uh, again, uh, you won over 10 awards for leadership in innovation and strategic project delivery with your remarkable experience in IP and business solutions. Any uh, you know, last word of advice or uh, any uh, recommendations or best practices that you would like to give out, especially to aspiring IT leaders looking to drive digital transformation in their organizations? For me, uh, whenever I get a CV um, for any role within my, my division, um, I just look to see what have they learned in the last one year or two years. Is there something that comes out in the CV apart from the experience? Is there something that you have learned? If you have really gone outside or or aligned to what you're working on, did you did you do some learning? Uh, if I see something like that, it actually makes me interested. And and if I see that consistently, those are the kind of people that I always am more inclined towards. You know, it's it's kind of a bias because it it shows me that the person actually respects knowledge, <laughs> and 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 that is something which I really appreciate. Um, for me too, I think uh, you know the. The conferences that we attend, the um, um, interactions that I have, the kind of places where I allocate time. I also want to make sure that, you know, maybe it's not courses and certifications per se, but there are things that you do where you're actually now trying to gain knowledge from people who know things better than you. And, you know, yesterday was Guru Purnima. And, and it's also a good way to, to, to acknowledge, um, you know, you're part of so many forums um, you're hearing wisdom from a lot of people. Of course, you can also hear a lot of nonsense from a lot of people, but you need to, to, to take the wisdom part and it helps you grow. And you need to give that back and you, do, you need to acknowledge that. Uh, when I'm looking at my own team, what the advice that I would give is, please seek wisdom, please seek knowledge, continue to learn. You will never know when this is going to come handy. I never imagined I'm going to be sitting in an industry photo to high tech factory trying to drive this plus digital services for this kind of a firm. I was, I began my career in, in Hellings and I was thinking I will do that. And, and right now it doesn't matter. I can move to any industry and I'll be able to, to make sure I can have an impact there. For that, you need to keep on learning. You are, that is one part. Second part is I think, you know, uh, trying to apply a lot of these very standard management principles um, is, is, is not really something that I'm and I'm, I'm going to be able to say a lot of positive things I get for. The, the most important thing is, uh, and this is coming from a, uh, a blog I just read the other day from a, a mentor of mine, where he said, you know, he has seen results when he is in love with the project. Now, I don't want to use the word the wrong way and give it the wrong connotation. But the thing is, you would really want to be so interested in getting this to work that, you know, this is this is uh, this is treated with a lot of care, a lot of sensitivity. And you're always switched on. Your antennas are always alert to anything that's happening in that space. So if you want something to work out well, you have to get involved. You have to get engaged to a very, very deep level. You know, it, it, there are some, uh, it, it's probably in the Vedas and whatever it says, whatever you're doing, do it with all your heart. <laughs> Only then it will mean something. Otherwise, you're wasting your time, you're wasting everybody else's time. So that's the second thing. Again, it's related to knowledge, but it's application of knowledge. The third one is showing an attitude that you want to go in there and, and make a difference. And these are the, the things. The rest of the things, you know, you uh, the last one I would say is, um, I'm reading a book that that's recently. It's actually called "The Courage to Be Disliked," uh, and um, it's it's an amazing book. And it's it's a it's a take on philosophy. But you should have the courage to be disliked. The moment you're disliked means you're doing something which either is horribly wrong, or is actually changing or causing a disruption, which is which is which is actually for a good thing. So 
um as, a, as long as you're not doing anything horribly wrong if you are being disliked because you're trying to push something which is positive and a good process and a best practice um i think you should have that courage you should have the the uh, uh confidence in you to say you know what i'm not going to stop because i'm disliked the other day i was having a chat with my uh, executive director and one of the things that i proposed he said that he doesn't really want to do it and i told him if i say no now uh, if i turn back and never come back to you it doesn't mean i've done the right thing i'm going to come back to you after some more time because i'm going to do a little bit more work because i believe this needs to be done but somehow you have not you're not aligned with me on this today but we'll come back on this but if you don't do this i believe it's going to be bad for this organization so that's the kind of conversations you need to have you know you're not really having to take it personally it's just that okay let's work on it again and come back and do this and attempt this again and you will get the results as long as you're convinced it's for the right the right reasons the writing said so and i cannot agree with you and in fact uh thank you so much for making this conversation very insightful and inspirational as well drawing insights from your own personal experiences right from you know uh, whether it's uh, team building or collaboration to adoption of ai or technologies like ai and erp modernization and again uh, thank you for sharing that wonderful piece of advice as well i'm sure uh, our listeners and viewers have a lot to take away from this session uh, mr joseph thank you once again for being a part of the series Thank you so much it was really lovely having this conversation i think the questions are also just very easy flowing i didn't pack too much of tech into it uh, there were a lot of acronyms i was thinking of then i was thinking well it's a different conversation so let's go with the flow uh, hope it was useful i really enjoyed it thank you so much. absolutely yes and with that we will be continuing the series